If you love ancient history, then this is the channel for you. History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but dedicated just to ad-free history documentaries, including a huge library of ancient history content from the 9th Legion to Boudicca to the First Britain. Simply check out the details in the description below and make sure you use code ODYSSEY on sign up. The field in question is in Standish near Gloucester, slap bang in the middle of one of the wealthiest areas of Roman Britain. And with finds ranging from the Iron Age to Roman, it should provide a snapshot of the lives of ordinary Brits at the time of the Roman invasion. Quite a little treasure trove that Paul's found. It's a terrific little hall. We've got Roman building material, Roman pottery, Roman brooches, Roman coins and some Iron Age stuff as well. Have we got any clues yet as to what it might be? I think the fact you've got Iron Age stuff and Roman stuff suggests it's probably a farmstead going through over that period. And in fact, the geophysics suggests that as well. You've done this already? We actually did it four years ago, but we've resurveyed it with a new instrument. And look, it's a whole complex of responses. Yeah, I mean, I think some of this oval stuff and circular stuff here looks like Iron Age stuff, perhaps Iron Age round housing enclosure. Whereas this rectilinear stuff is more what we expect from Roman fields, you know, Roman paddocks and probably even some buildings in there as well. Is this where you got all the finds from? No, most of the finds came from this area. And we haven't surveyed that yet, so we're going to have to extend the geophysics yeah. to cover right to the edge of the field. Did you put a trench in? I put a trench in on John's earlier geophysics down there. And what did you get? I, well, I believe I found an Iron Age surface. What do you mean you believe you found one? Well, the week that I chose last year it happened to be the hottest week of the year and I had to close the trench down to preserve the archaeology. So you're not quite sure what you got? No, I'm not, no. What are we going to do? Well, I think probably the first thing could be to reopen uh, Paul's trench and see just what you had there. But there's plenty of other targets on the geophysics, isn't there? Like what? Well, perhaps these pits, are they Iron Age? Yeah. And it'd also be nice to look at some of the rectilinear ditches, see exactly what see the date is. actually Roman, yeah. Yeah! And again. Phil's looking for the early end of our story in Trench 1, where he's expecting to find an Iron Age roundhouse next to the stone surface that Paul uncovered last year. <laughs> yeah, I think that's Paul's excavation. <laughs> Matt puts in Trench 2 over these two large pits. Finds from these should give us an idea of what people were eating and chucking away here and when. Geophys are on the hunt for a Roman building in the area of the field where Paul found most of his roofing tiles and tesserae pieces from mosaics. Could there be a villa here? An hour into the dig, and the unpredictable British summer is causing Phil problems in Trench 1 as he tries to make sense of Iron Age archaeology in wet clay. The problem is identifying individual cut features. What, you're going to have to rely on the geophysics, you mean? If that'll solve me for once, I'd, I'd, I'd relish the thought. So it wasn't like this last year when you dug it? No, hottest day of the year. <laughs> Ever hottest recorded. day of the year? Ever recorded, yeah. <laughs> Jane, now you've had a chance to look at all of Paul's pottery, have you been able to draw any conclusions from it? Well, he's found a very interesting assemblage of Roman pottery. He has fine Samian tableware from central and eastern Gaul. He has one piece of amphora, which we know comes from southern Spain, and that would have been used to contain olive oil. Oh, that's nice. And here we have a range of material imported from Poole Harbour in Dorset, black burnished ware. And we also have a range of ceramic building material, mostly roofing tile. So we're getting the whole range of material you might expect from a well-appointed Roman household. What kind of date are we talking about for this 
Mostly we're looking at material dating from the 2nd to 4th century. Paul's finds bear striking similarities with Froster Court, just five miles away. Excavations there have revealed an Iron Age farmstead which evolves over the centuries into a substantial stone-built Roman villa with roofing tiles and ceramic wares just like the ones from our field. It's taken over three decades to untangle the story at Froster. But at Standish, we've got just three days. It's brightened up in Trench One. Ooh. Phil and Raksha have literally hit their first find next to the probable roundhouse. Look at that, truncated pot, just going right the way round. I mean, this is good. I mean, I know we've hit the top off of it, but at least it gives us that answer. How deep do we have to machine? That's as far as we dare machine. Look at it. The pits in Trench 2 have already thrown us a bit of a curved ball. Oh, dear. It's skull. Nobody was expecting human remains here. That looks very, very human, doesn't it? It does. Not much of a ridge. No. Around the whole bit. Young lady. A young lady. <laughs> Who is she and when did she die? But I think most of it went with the, uh, with the, with the plough. Uh, in right. Trench one, Phil's Jane called here. Jane in to help identify his pot. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm dying to know what sort of pot it is and, and how old it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have a very big pot here, Phil, and you've got a tiny piece of rim just here, which suggests to me you've got a large storage jar with a slightly averted rim. And we're looking at something that would have come right round cool. up to this. So we have lost probably over half of it. It's got little shell fragments of white shell in it, which is local, so this suggests it's been locally made. Yeah. And we can see little red-brown pieces. So is that the local grog. sand or something? No, this is grog. Grog is pre-fired clay, pottery, it's already been fired and then it's crushed up again and added back into the clay. Right. And it makes it much more plastic and malleable for forming right. large vessels such as this. And so uh, does that enable you to give some sort of date to it? It does, because Grog, as a technology, is introduced into Gloucestershire in around the early first century AD. The Iron Age people who used this pot lived through some dramatic changes because they witnessed the Roman invasion and the imposition of a whole new political and economic structure. But how long did they cling on to their Iron Age lifestyle while the landscape around them changed? Military colonies sprung up at Gloucester and Cirencester, and a major Roman road carved through the countryside. How far do you reckon our farm is from this Roman road? Oh, it's not very far at all. It's only about a kilometre and a half. If you can imagine, in the Roman landscape, the military need lots of produce to move around. They need farms to provide grain, hides, all that sort of thing. In the Roman economy, they actually take over the, the earlier Iron Age farms, as it were, and drag them into their economy, like tenant farmers. That's got to be a hill fort, isn't it? It, it? it is, yeah. You see, there's this big promontory right on the edge of the Cotswolds, dominating all this landscape out towards the Severn. Classic place for an Iron Age hill fort. And there you've got our site sort of stuck between the two, haven't you? That, on this step of flat land. That's right. It's actually prime agricultural ground. and. Of course, that's why the site is there. It's a farmstead. It's exploiting this good ground in the Iron Age period and through the Roman period and beyond. Bridge is looking for the later Roman end of the story in the more rectilinear ditches of Trench 3. A bit more interesting. A bit like burnish wear or something. Just a few metres away in Trench 2, the human remains are now looking like a burial. It's uh, obviously a skeleton, but can you say any more than that, Mark? Well, from the actual position of the body, it's oh. clearly in a crouched position on its side, tightly flexed. So what would that indicate? One, one of two possibilities for date, either late Neolithic, early Bronze Age or late Iron Age. And what would your money be on at the moment? My money would be on late Iron Age, given that we know there's late Iron Age material from the site. How does it fit in with the geophys? Well, the geophysics here, I mean, we're looking for these two anomalies. Is this one of them? No. You wouldn't expect 
something to show with that kind of strength on the geophysics that's just a grave, unless you've got a lot of grave goods. Paul, can we borrow you for a minute? Yes. Could you run your little machine over this, see if you can get any iron spikes? Yes, there's iron in there. Whereabouts? Whereabouts? Just there, by the shoulder. Hey! Up here. So yeah. what might that be? Well, that's nice, because if you've got a strong iron signal up by the shoulder, first of all, it tells us it's not Bronze Age, but secondly, it could well be an iron brooch, which are not uncommon in late Iron Age barrels. And that's something we can date. Excellent. So we know that Iron Age people were dying here, but where did they live? The answer to that might be in Trench 1, where Phil attempts to locate an Iron Age roundhouse. You cheered up yet? You were as miserable as sin this morning. With reason, Tony, with reason. What's your reason? Well, I'm digging on clay. You wouldn't believe it, but clay is the most difficult material to work on. It really is. I mean, if it's sunny, then it dries and it goes like concrete and cracks. If it chucks it down raining, it's an absolute quagmire. Believe it or not, this overcast, damp sort of atmosphere is just about the most ideal thing. It, it just shows up the contrast so much better. Now look, come and have a look at this. Here's our trench, yeah. L-shaped. That bit is that bit along there. Yeah. And then it, it runs out in that direction along there. Now then, be led by this big black blob there. You see in the corner here, we've got this big area with pottery. It's very, very dark. Yeah. Now then, here we've got this straight line, this ditch. In here fact, somewhere? Just, well, you're standing here, on this, it. This, you're standing yeah. on it. Yeah. Oh, look. I can see it. Well, look, there's a piece of pot there, and it's running along and running straight up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. Here we've got another curving one going round there. And this is a bit more difficult to see. But if you're led by these bits of pot in there, yeah. bit of bone there, another bit of pot, and it's actually coming round yeah, yeah, here yeah, yeah. like that. So what you've done really is to have confirmed the geophysics, isn't it? Yeah, but that is what's so good about it. I mean, we can now rely on these, this geophysical print to tell us about the rest of the site. So could these marks in the clay be the remains of an Iron Age roundhouse? And since we have complete faith in Geophys, can they find us our Roman villa? Now done the whole of this end of the field right. where all the Roman building material was supposed to come from. Right. And you can doesn't, see for yourself. Doesn't look anything Roman there to me. No, I mean, we've yeah. got some fantastic results, but as you say, it all looks as though it's probably Iron Age, a series of probable roundhouses. Yeah. Curvilinear ditches, paddocks, enclosures, nothing rectangular, regular that strikes you as sort of Roman building. No, no. But, I mean, there are a number of targets there. I mean, that, for example, looks quite a nice thing to look at, isn't it? It looks like a roundhouse. Yeah, it? it's it, got it, an entrance to the south east. That's exactly yeah. it. OK, so let's have a, let's have a look at that one. In, in the meantime, you'll carry on, won't you? Yeah, the... because if you look, I think we've got a boundary to the settlement there. Right. Could it come round and follow that? Well, it'd be nice to see if there was yeah. an enclosure with nothing yeah. beyond it, wouldn't it? Or fields beyond it. And then we'll have to come back to this part. God, how big is this field? Too big. <laughs> oh, God, you <laughs> can do it! So there's still no sign of a Roman building to go with Paul's finds. But it looks like we have a much earlier structure. Trench 4 goes in over the shape of our second possible Iron Age roundhouse under Kerry's watchful eye. That's it, that's it, isn't it? That's it, coming through. Just give it... Or should that be John? <laughs> <laughs> Your trench. <laughs> no, no, no. Just give it one more and then, then we'll do what John wants. <laughs> that's better. The Bally Sun's come out. In Trench 1, Phil's mood is as changeable as the weather. Look how long the shadows are. You can't see a thing. Can't see a thing. Go away. I'm grumpy again. We haven't found any grave goods buried with our skeleton in Trench 2, and mysteriously, the iron signal that the metal detector picked up has disappeared. It's ready now to lift and plan and right. photograph. Well, and do we still think it's Iron Age? Well, the only finds come out of the fill of this so far is Roman pottery. Oh. So it has to be early Roman or Roman at least. Right. No so, earlier than that. So not Iron Age at all. Our bones experts confirmed the skeleton to be a woman in her late 30s who probably died after the Roman invasion. 
buried without grave goods, the chances are she was a low-status worker. It's been a productive day one, glimpsing into the lives of the British at the time of the Roman invasion. And in Trench 3, Bridge is getting some clues as to what happened next. Bridget? Yes? You got something interesting there? Well, it's a very tantalising pot piece here, um, and I'm just itching to get into it, just in case it's whole. <laughs> would be nice, wouldn't it? Is what it do you reckon it is, Mark? I think it's probably black burnish ware, which was made on the South Dorset coast. So what would that have been used for? It's fairly everyday stuff, cooking, storage, that kind of thing. And did all this lot come out of the same yeah. trench? We've got amazing bits of pottery here. Look, we've got these lovely rims here. We've got a piece of Samian. We've got some bases. We've got black burnished ware. And we've got some incised decoration. It's just wonderful. Yeah. So what story is this telling us? Well, most of this stuff is coming into the second century AED. So this is the local potting industry in a Romanized tradition. People are now starting to get access to imports from France. We've got amphora from Spain. It's all part of the gradual Romanization of the settlement and people slowly moving up market. What about structure in this trench? Well, there's certainly evidence again. We've got more roofing tile coming up. Yep, so there's certainly here. something fairly close by. And we've got this daub here that was used for the walls of a Roman building. Mm. But no foundations, no walls, nothing like Absolutely that? Not nothing. yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but there's always tomorrow. Beginning of day two here at Standish in Gloucestershire. And in this field, we've had the most extraordinarily good geophys. All these curved features, that round one there, which I'm told is probably a roundhouse. In fact, the whole thing is a great Iron Age landscape. But what really interests me is the possibility that there's a Roman villa here. We've had lots of finds, haven't we? Lots of pottery, but no structure at all. You were shaking your head. Why? Because I don't think we should go villa chasing. What do you I mean? Well, there's clearly some Roman activity somewhere in this field but we don't quite know what it's indicating yet. But there's nothing on the geophysics that indicates anything like a Roman villa. OK, so what do we do about it? Well, John has said there's enough noise in this area here that might be a timber-built structure. So what I think we do is put a trench in here next to where we found the freshly broken stuff and see if that's not where the centre of, of Roman activity is. But what about the Iron Age? I mean, we haven't even got the focus of that yet, have we? No, I mean, well, there probably isn't a focus to that in the sense of a, a sort of centre of a, a, an estate, probably a scatter of buildings across the landscape. So we need to continue with the three areas we've got open. We need to know whether it's early Iron Age stuff, whether it's, it goes right the way through, whether it's just at the Roman end of the, the Iron Age. We'll get that from what we've got in the holes. The early part of our story is coming on, with excavations over two possible Iron Age features. Phil's now convinced that he's found our first structure, an Iron Age roundhouse. Bit by bit, he's lifting the huge storage pot sunk in the middle of it. Hello, little rim. You're not supposed to be up there. Our Iron Age Brits would have used this pot to store their grain or water. Trench 4, which was placed over the second roundhouse, has produced results that even I can see. This trench is really coming on now, isn't it? You can really see this thick, black, curving line and yep. it sort of stops here and then starts up again all the way around to where you are. Yeah. I mean, it's lovely because it matches perfectly what we saw in the geophysics and we thought might be evidence of an Iron Age roundhouse and we're now fairly happy that's what we've got. So why have you got this big black line? Well, people tend to call these things drip gullies and assume they've been formed by water running off the eaves of a thatched roof. They're but quite then irregular. But it stops, doesn't it? And then yeah. it doesn't start again. The, the actual building itself would have actually been within this, set back perhaps a metre from the inner edge of the yeah. ditch. And you'd have an entrance about so wide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you look where Ian is, there's a lot of pottery coming out of there, so there's no doubt about the date of this. Uh, yeah, we've got things like this, which is a classic Middle Iron Age type of rim, probably talking about 3rd, 2nd century BC. So why have we got a big black blob right in the middle of a roundhouse? Yeah. In fact, it's a ditch of Roman date that would have been cut through here long after the roundhouse itself had disappeared. Some of the other blobs may turn out to be Iron Age pits and give us some more dating evidence. We're only going to find out by excavators. So we just keep going down now? Absolutely. 
At the time of the Roman conquest in AD 45, Standish was in the pro-Roman Dubunny region of late Iron Age Britain. As our farmstead became enmeshed in the Roman military structure, our Romano Brits, as they became known, could have accumulated sufficient wealth to aspire to leave their Iron Age roundhouses behind them and upgrade to a posh new house built with the roofing tiles, daub and tesserae that Paul found. So where is it? In goes Trench 5. That hasn't moved very far either. It's really nice quality. Pretty unabraded pottery Excellent. altogether, saying that there should be more substantial structural features somewhere nearby. The pottery that Bridges found is so sharp-edged in comparison to Paul's finds that our archaeologists have had to reconsider the location of any Roman structure. It now seems that centuries of ploughing have moved the finds up the field, away from their original location near trenches five and three. It looks like we're getting closer to our building in trench two, where Matt's found some rubble that could be from the foundations of a Roman building. And among it, some iron slag. Ah, here we go. Beauty. Is that from the bottom of the furnace? Where you burn your ore and all the clag goes to the bottom and kind of sets iron working on site. <laughs> so our Romano Brits were making iron products here, such as the iron axe that Paul found with his metal detector. John, before you slope off to lunch, have you finished the geophys on this area yet? We've not done the whole field, but I think we've got the whole complex map now. You remember the boundary on this side of the field. Mm. We've now extended and look at this sort of funnel arrangement at that point. It's weird, it's like a little entrance way in there, isn't it? Yeah, and we've extended this way and clearly got the limits of the whole complex. So what does all that say to you? Well, I think we can stop. Stop geophysy? Yes. Well, you can have a lunch break, give us a lift. <laughs> well, well, I think it could be anything it. in the rest of the field. It might be a pyramid. Mark, what do these Iron Age settlements look like? In this area, we've got very little to go on, any sort of comparative material. The best site still is Froster, just a few miles to the south of here, which of course does develop into a villa. You can see we've got this irregular, come rectilinear, ditched enclosure. And then within that, the excavations revealed numerous circular structures. If you compare that with the geophysics that we've got from here at Standish, you can see we've got these very similar types of enclosure and of course at least three circular structures, two of which we've now confirmed by excavation. And the fact that we've got th at least three of these suggests that we may be seeing the beginnings of a small village starting to form in the closing centuries of the Iron Age. As to how it actually looks, I mean, we, we can only speculate, but Victor's been working on a rather fine sketch here that you know, gives a, a nice impression of what we've just been talking about. You can see each of the roundhouses, these smaller plots perhaps being used for vegetable growing, corralling animals, and probably we can get extended family units occupying each of these little plots. So this looks a bit like a snapshot in maybe the middle of the first century AD, because I see here on the edge somebody's experimenting with the more Roman style yes, of building. Yes, there's a house. radical new introduction, yes. Corners, yes. yes. Are you as frustrated as I am by the fact that we still haven't found this villa? Well, yes, I am. I'm mean, in a way, because it'd be lovely to find a lovely Roman villa with stone walls and mosaics. Underfloor heating, fountains. Oh, yeah, the whole shooting match. It'd be great. But, you know, we know there's about a thousand Roman villas in this country of different shapes and sizes. And even if you stick 50 people in them to include the family and slaves and farm workers and that sort of thing, that's only 50,000 people out of a population we know must have been anywhere between three, perhaps as much as six million. So where were the rest of them living? Well, what we now know from modern archaeology is that far more of them were living in ordinary rural farmsteads. And even, you know, the Iron Age roundhouse we're always hearing about. That building remained in use throughout Britain, throughout the Roman period. But there are wooden Roman buildings as well. Exactly. Now, the kind of thing that we could have is a basic timber frame. When you drop a, a timber into the sleeper trench like that, 
and you build up a frame of timbers all the way along and in between that a lattice work of wattle and daub so that's a sort of twig-like structure here framework slap plaster on top of it that is perfectly strong enough to support a heavy tiled roof you can stick painted wall plaster on it you can still have mosaics but presumably it's going to be much harder for our archaeologists to find exactly because we can only see what is visible to us and unless timber has been burnt it's just not going to be there if guy's right there'll be nothing to see but clay phil's favorite but there's a ray of hope in trench five bridget i hear you've got a bit of wall yeah. Oh, crikey, yeah. Look Yesterday, I wanted to get some structure and bingo, look what's here. All this masonry. But it's, it's not a very massive structure, is it? No, it's not at all. It's only about 40 centimetres. I don't think it's enough to be called footings for a masonry wall. But it could be for a timber wall. If you put a, a one-foot square timber in, on top of that, yeah. you could support a timber frame building. Then, Absolutely. You? What I think we need to do is actually do some resistance survey. Right. Um, I hear what you say, it's not a solid stone foundation, but we stand a better chance of seeing a building with resistance. Until now, John's been using magnetometry, which measures changes in the Earth's magnetism and shows up metals and heat-affected areas. The resistance survey will pass an electric current through the ground. Solid features such as stone impede the current and will show up as high readings against the low readings of clay soils. Stuart, what are you doing on a bike in the middle of a field? Well, riding it, I suppose, is the, is the obvious answer, but uh, this, this is my mobile incident room. I've got, got everything I need here. I've got I've got my aerial photograph, I've got mobility and I've got the landscape around me. It's a great way to, to do landscape archaeology. That's all you need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the field where we're finding uh -huh. all the remains in there. We're standing here. And down here is a very, very major stream going all the way down. Yeah. Now, if we know from other sites, if there's a villa, and they say if, it's a big mm -hmm. if, it ought to be somewhere along this stream course. We, we know the site at Froster, to the south. A very similar site to here, and that has a villa with it. And where is it? It's next to the only major stream source. Stuart goes in search of a villa elsewhere. But the archaeologists are still convinced that the finds suggest a substantial Roman building within our field. So Mick and Jane decide to take another look at the pottery. This is of particular interest. And it looks a bit sad. It was a piece of Samian. Really? It so it looked, looked like that it originally? It would have looked like that originally. Good Lord, so really worn. And it's particularly prestigious, this item, because it's a lion's head from a multarium with a hole in his mouth area for pouring, a spout. And we can just see the grits on the inside area. Okay. This would have created a surface for grinding. Right. And it would have dated to the late second, early third century. And one decent handle. And one decent handle. And <laughs> you would like this, Tony, because that would have been a tankard. How big? Well, I'm told they can go up to three pints. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is more Very... fills than yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what's the latest material we've got? The latest we have is this little black burnished ware dish, a little right. flanged conical bowl. With a, with a big sort of rim sticking out. Exactly. Almost. This was made from around 270, so that's the late 3rd century, and they still made them into the 4th century. But that's still sort of a long time before the end of the Roman period. It is then. a long time. What does all this tell you? Well, I think it confirms that we've got an Iron Age site going right the way through, but not quite through to the end of the Roman period. I would have expected at that end to see you know, tesserae, wall plaster, heating flue tiles. I know we've got a few tesserae from the field, but from what we've done, we've got nothing that would shout villa. Bombshell, so that means there might never have been a villa at all here. I think that's like, well, we've got to see what Bridget comes up with in the trench she's opened up. But I, yeah, no, I think that's probably, that's what it's looking like, I think. I told you we shouldn't be chasing a villa. No, you no, wouldn't I, listen to I, me, I, would I just you? didn't, I ignored you, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I didn't listen. The Iron Age end of our story is taking shape in Trench 4. Ian has discovered an intriguing stack of pots sunk into the entrance of the roundhouse. Nobody yet knows why they were buried. Stewards failed to find any sign of a villa elsewhere, so all eyes are on the geophys. John? 
What did you threaten to do at lunchtime? Stop geofizzing, you've been beavering about all afternoon. Yeah, well, Mick wouldn't let us. Remember the wall in Bridget's Trench over there? Yeah. Comes through on that sort of angle. We've now done the resistance, and look, we've got this fantastic change between the low resistance, the yellow, and the high resistance, and that's where you'll have building rubble, maybe foundations. Could that possibly be our villa? Well, look where it is on the map. There's Bridget's Trench, and it's right in the centre of this area of interest. There's one caveat. What? It could be that it's all geological. Oh. Ready when you are. There's just about time for Phil to dig a test trench to find out if the geophys shows archaeology or geology. Yeah. So they're going to come down on the mosaic floor. Well, if it is, <laughs> I still think it looks very clean at the moment. still looks so bally clean, yeah. doesn't it? John's not looking too confident. See, this stuff is just so dry compared to the clay. This is going to look like gravel, it's going to look like um, building rubble. Whereas this clay by comparison, it's just so moist and full of water. That's going to be the contrast in resistance. So it's all geology. Now our best hope for a building is in Trench 5, where Bridget's line of rubble is looking like the foundations of a timber structure. If we've only got that one wall, and one wall doesn't make a building, so ah, but where's we the haven't, rest of it? We haven't quite got one wall. It looks like we've got a return. You see, just coming up here towards oh, yeah. your foot. But down here, you mean? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, and right. so there would be two rooms attached to the one wall. Yeah. Well, it's the most substantial thing we've had, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it is. It's substantial. And also, what's very nice is we've found something that could imply a substantial building. Oh, we've got crikey. a tessera, a very, very nice fine-grained limestone. It could be a mosaic fairly close. Well, we shouldn't be too surprised, because Roman timber buildings can be substantial, reasonably impressive buildings in their own right. And we know from towns like London that they could have tessellated mosaic floors and painted wall plaster and mm -hmm. substantial um, tiled roofs. So that, that doesn't negate the fact that it might still be timber that we're looking at. No, no, not at all. Right, I, I'm we're surprised looking, at that, to be well, honest. We're not looking at a palace. No. At no, all, by no. any means. But I think that's a very interesting sign. OK. okay well, so have we found a luxury Roman pad, a pretty basic one, or nothing at all? We're ready to start the serious work of day three, looking for our Roman building. The situation is this, over there in Matt's trench you've got all that stone but it looks like it's probably only rubble, whereas here in Bridget's trench you've got something that looks a bit more promising down here. Now we can't excavate the whole area between these two trenches so we're going to be relying on John's geofiz. No you're not. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because we've drawn a blank. Yuck. Well here's Matt's trench, there's Bridget's trench. This is all geology. Between the two, we've got nothing. Mick? It's, it's OK. We just go back to first principles. Again. Which are? Well, you know, in the old days, when we didn't have geophysics, you just extend the excavated area and see what you've got. So we've got walls and things in here. We move this way, see if we've got other walls to go with it. He's being his usual bright, happy Birmingham self. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all with him. As far as I'm concerned, he's right. That's a yeah. wall down there. So what we have to do is work over here, find another wall, make sense of this building. Well, given that we found absolutely nothing, they're being remarkably <laughs> sunny. We'll see how they feel at lunchtime. That's it. With just one day left, it's time to bring in the heavies. Phil joins Bridge in Trench 5. Ooh, what's this? Oh, it's a ring. Oh, it looks it's like a handle, doesn't it? No, it's, oh, it's the rim of something, more like a vase or something, doesn't it? Any roll, we can sort that out in a minute. Let's get on and strip this off. There's a fascinating twist to our Iron Age story emerging from Trench 4, where Ian found the stack of pots. You got bones coming up there? Oh, just a few. It's a horse. Or it's part of a horse. I mean, this is really getting to be very exciting. Why do you say that's exciting? 
Well, in, in the middle and late Iron Age, across much of southern Britain, you do get these things that people call structured or special deposits. And Ian's exposed here three or four pots that are superimposed and crushed. We've got another pot here. All this burnt stone. So are you saying that these and the horse are deliberately put in here? It in is a, a deliberate deposit. Quite often these deposits are thought to be associated with special events, like perhaps the abandonment of this house and its demolition. It could be like a closure event. And perhaps this involves a feast, and then everything that was associated with that feast, it's all gathered up and placed into this. What's the significance of the horse? Uh, the, the horse is an animal that takes on growing status in the Iron Age. If you can be seen to afford to kill and consume a horse, it confirms your rank. I mean, it might have been the old nagging, honestly, but it's still a horse. Have you got any dating for this? Yeah, the, the potter is giving us some very good dating information. It's towards the end of the Middle Iron Age in this area, so it's between about 150 and 50 BC. So the roundhouse in Trench 4 must have been closed around 50 BC. The pottery in Phil's roundhouse dates to the first century AD. We'd taken it for granted that our Iron Age farmstead consisted of a group of roundhouses, but it now seems impossible that all three can have coexisted, and that's a bad sign for Victor. You're going to have to go back to the drawing board. That was abandoned by the time these two were going. So you mean demolish that? Yeah. And build that one? Yeah. Oh, my God. As we search for some clarity to the Roman end of our story, every find helps. Jane, we were just looking at this big old rim, wondering whether it might be amphora or storage jar. Well, Phil, I think what you've got here is a very large storage jar. Quite a squat dumpy pot, but quite a hefty thing for storage. So it's, it's, it's about, what, this high? I would guess so, yes. And we're looking at the later part of the Roman period, maybe 4th century. The date of the storage pot confirms that people were living here late into the Roman period. But where were they living? It's mid-morning and the rubble foundations seem to be dying out. I'll tell you something else. There, there's no finds over on this side too. No, there's nothing. Nothing. It's clean as a whistle. Well, I, I mean, think we'll move over, Roger, please. In Trench 1, Mark and Paul are cleaning up the Iron Age surface that Paul excavated last year. Mark, are we actually inside the roundhouse here? Yes, we are, yeah, and just sort of cleaning up around these packed stones here. Is this natural? No, you see a lot of these are actually sort of fire reddened, so it could be the base of a hearth or an oven. Oh, it's stiff old stuff, isn't it? Yeah. So this would have been the hearth that our family sat round, talking about the arrival of the Romans or the state of the farm. Not much evidence of buildings in Trench 5, but some interesting finds. That's fantastic. It's a very nice beveled edge on it as well. It's part of a quern stone, which would have been placed on top of another one and turned. They were used for grinding corn. Trench 5 has expanded in every direction since this morning, but I'm not sure there's much to show for it. I've stripped off a big area out here in an attempt to follow the spread of material out here, and it dies out. And so then we decided, OK, we'd go backwards to try and find the other side. Nothing there. Nah, well, there is something there. You see, what you've got to remember, Tony, is that this whole site is just smashed around by ridge and furrow. Mm. Well, so, this is medieval ploughing. Yeah. You see, the sequence is a big furrow over yeah. there, yeah. and then here, where the main rubble spread is, yeah. is the ridge, yeah. and then it comes down here into the furrow, and this, of course, is where the front of the building we would expect it to be. Yeah. So that's why this rubble is in this long, thin shape. It doesn't mean that the building looked like that, it's just that we've lost the sides of it. Yeah, it could well be. We, we, we might just have survival under the ridges. We've lost the rest. So, but, Mick, have we got a building or have we not? Well, we might have. <laughs> look, look, do you see this spread of material here? We think that there is a good possibility that at right angles we might have a partition to that main wall. So, we've ended up with a load of rubble 
in the ground and a bit of stuff there that might be a partition and that's all that we can yeah, say about whether or not we've got a building. Yeah, but we have one card to play with the remaining time, haven't we? What's that? We do. That is to extend the trench in that direction to see whether we can find the end of the building over there and possibly a return underneath the ridge over there. Well, it's... 10 to 1 now. Yeah. Lunch and then the final throw? Yep. Right. So that sounds a good plan. Medieval farms consisted of long, thin strips heavily ploughed into high ridges and deep furrows. Crops were planted on top of the ridges. The furrows must have cut through our archaeology. The effect on the land was so dramatic that you can still see the lines of ridge and furrow in our geophys. The final throw is underway in Trench 5, and things are looking up. There are big stones all the way through there, and that is on exactly the same alignment as that set of stones coming through here. Stuart's been drawing together his observations. Having an absolute field day, literally, with this. <laughs> I mean, what, it's absolutely staggering about this field is, can you see these old field boundaries? Yeah. Are they very different to the modern ones? Can you see how that axis is parallel to this one here? And how that one, it goes through there, respects the alignment of that group of paddocks. Now, what this suggests to me quite strongly is that these are the same boundaries that were laid out in the Iron Age and the Roman period, and they've survived right through to the present day. If you look at the wider picture, the complex we've got, is not going to be the only one. There'll be others. They're part of a whole network of long boundaries which carve up this landscape, this strip of good agricultural ground we've got between the Highland to the east, the Cotswold Edge, and the River Severn out here. You're only just a little bit below the modern plough yes, yes. when, when you look at it. Yeah. And the, the medieval would have been probably up somewhere about here. Yeah. Eddie Price has been excavating his farm at Froster Court for over 30 years and is used to making sense of the patchy archaeology preserved in the ridges of the medieval ploughing. Can you see any internal detail? Because we keep looking at it, you know. And um, you, you've, obviously got a, you've obviously got a gravelish floor. Right. And fallen roof tile, suggesting you're on a building which is roofed anyway. Yeah. Your quern stone and the pottery finds suggest you could be domestic. Yeah. But, um, but you think more like a certain, farm building. But more, uh, more like a, a farm workers' building or something right. of that nature, right. probably. So, how different was life on the Roman farm in the third and fourth centuries from the life led by the Romano Brits in the first century AD? and the way that the Iron Age farmers who enjoyed their horse barbecue lived their lives in the last centuries BC. Mick, could it be that the people living here in Iron Age times were various generations of just one family? I think that's very likely. I mean, you tend to see a lot of sites on the geophysics and a lot of stuff in the ground. I think there's lots of people. But it's actually probably the same extended family, quite a big family, yeah. just hopping around the landscape and eventually ending up, of course, in the medieval village over there. Sure. So, Jane, if this is all one extended family, what story can we tell from your finds? Well, we're starting in Kerry's Trench. We're up in the middle to late Iron Age. We're talking around 1st century BC here. It's pretty rough stuff, isn't it? It's very rough stuff. It's come from across the Severn, typical Iron Age. Not sophisticated at all. Things have changed, haven't they, by the time we get to Phil's Trench? We've jumped on quite a lot now. Nearly a century, 50, 50 years to a century. We're still using the same technology, the same handmade traditions. This is his very large pot he had set in the ground. But we're suddenly beginning to see evidence of Roman occupation. So are, are we before the Roman conquest here and they're getting bits of Roman goods or are we actually after the Roman conquest? We're after the conquest, right. but we're right. still native in our habits and our right. traditions. Right. The stuff from Bridget's Trench is completely different, isn't it? A completely different story, very Roman. We're getting Exotica, we're getting imports from Spain, Amphora, we're getting the fine tablewares, we're getting imports from Dorset, and we're getting all the local wares developing. What sort of date are we there? Uh, we're into third, the second yeah. century on this one, yeah. and moving into second and third on this one. 
clearly they've got a lot of international trade going on, but they're also getting pottery by presumably going down to the market, buying the yes. pottery and what they can put in it. So they're part of a proper market economy. And then in Phil's second trench, we've got all these lovely big chunks. We have. We're definitely into the third century here. Very nice spouts from a mortarium for grinding materials. I don't understand. Where, where, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> where is it? Huge big bowl studded with little grits. It's for so making it's pesto, for making... Tony, that's what it's for. <laughs> <laughs> you put your olive oil and your basil and your pine nuts in, grind them all round and pour them out onto your salad. Exactly. It's very bourgeois. <laughs> It's funny, when we first came here, what I wanted to find was the Roman building. But what's interesting me now is the idea of all these generations of the same family in the Iron Age living in this one field. Great stuff. So our story begins in the second century BC with our Iron Age farmers living a peaceful Iron Age existence in the shadow of the hill fort at Haresfield. Around 50 BC, they upgrade to a new roundhouse and witness the drama of the Roman invasion unfold around them. But how does our story end? Our last throw of the dice in our quest for the Roman building was the extension of Phil's trench over here. How do you reckon you did? I think we've done really well. We haven't found you a villa, but I think we've got a cracking story out of this, haven't I, we? I think it's absolutely amazing. Tell me I through mean, it, then. What we're actually standing in is the yard of a, of a Roman farm. And the sort of activities that were going on in that yard include metalworking. Look, we've got this lovely little fire-reddened uh, furnace base. And the nice thing about it is that we've actually got some, some metalworking slag. All well, right, this is the yard, but where's the farm? The farm starts here. This wall here is actually the boundary of the farmyard. And I think what's happening is that they're actually throwing all their refuse on the other side, because on that side of the wall, we had masses and masses of pottery. On this side, absolutely nothing. Now, if you come on to here, we've actually got the first of our buildings. We've got the foundations going along here, and they turn round here and come back. So, in fact, we actually had the building in the trench all along, but we just hadn't cleaned up enough to be able to see where it was. The beauty of it is we've actually got another building, and the other building is out here. We've actually got a foundation that comes along here. It's missing here because of the furrow, the medieval furrow. Here is the ridge, and we've got a bit of the foundation, and it carries on through there. That's one side. The other side, is in here and look there is the base of that foundation so we've got a large building here facing out onto the yard and a much smaller building also facing out onto the yard finally we're able to piece together an impression of our roman farm the outbuildings could have housed the blacksmith who used the furnace the farmhouse would have been a timber construction our romano brits had made it but not quite enough to be able to afford the grand villa, although they still had painted plaster, a mosaic floor, and the latest sandstone roofing tiles. In three days, we've caught a glimpse of 600 years of an ordinary Iron Age farming family living through extraordinary times.